Paul's first six letters were written during the time of his three missionary journeys, about 10 years in total, 48 to 58 AD. You know, the exact order uh, of the letters is really difficult to pinpoint, but it's most probable that after the first journey, he wrote Galatians that we're going through now. Uh, the second journey, he wrote 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. During his third journey, he wrote 1st and 2nd Corinthians and Romans. And from prison, he wrote the remaining seven for a total of 13 letters from Paul in the New Testament. And I want to remind you who that guy was. He was the guy, he was the henchman for the Sanhedrin. He was the guy out there imprisoning and even watching over the, the killing of Christians. And until Jesus got a hold of him and his life changed, and then he became the number one theologian, recruiter, writer of even the New Testament. Just amazing. I wonder if somebody got him a Gideon New Testament, Bruce. I wonder, maybe that's what it was. There was a town of Galatia in the Roman province of Galatia. And Paul's letter to the Galatians that we've got in our Bibles was most probably written to an unknown number of churches in that province of Galatia. And it means that Paul was writing to Christians in the towns of Iconium, Lystra, Derby, locations of the churches that he founded on his first missionary journey that we've been looking at on Wednesday nights, as we're now in the book of Acts, going through chapters 13, 14, to tell all about when Paul was in Galatia, what he did. Now, the theme of Galatians, what is it? It's freedom. What exactly does that mean? <clears throat> you do whatever you want and not have to pay for it. You're not getting in trouble for it. Well, what, what's that freedom mean? Freedom from what? Well, I'll tell you. Um, freedom in Jesus that we're going to look at a little more today is something that is short-lived when legalism enters the picture. Uh, I want you to remember that Paul was writing this letter because he heard that the Judaizers, I, if you don't know about who these guys, these are um, a large group of, um, of Jewish teachers that thought they were also followers of Jesus. All they did was add Jesus to what they were already believing in Judaism as Jews. And they added what Jesus taught and just kind of, they just, they put Judaism plus Jesus. Um, and they were lost. And these Judaizers and I, I, I the term Judaizer funny to me because I think of a, I think of sanitizer. A sanitizer makes everything ju sanitary. A Judaizer makes everybody Jewish. That's what they wanted to do. So they wanted to make, find all these new Christians in these new churches. They're like following Paul. Paul goes places, plants a church, Judaizers show up. Have you noticed it? He travels, plants another church, the Judaizers come in behind and they start unwinding, reteaching what Paul taught. And that's Paul's issue, and that's why Paul's writing this letter, um, saying, oh my gosh, uh, I, I've heard what's going on, and, and that you're actually believing what they said. So chapter 3 is where we pick up the study of Corinthians. Chapter 3, verse 1. And, and I want you to understand, Paul is furious, not only with the Judaizers, but He's furious with these new Christians that he actually brought to Christ for believing what the Judaizers were teaching instead of what Paul taught. And so this letter helped them and it helps us today get free from thinking that we're only loved and accepted by God through religious ritual. That's what we're free from. That's religion. That's the freedom in Christ. We're free from that. We don't, we don't have to light candles, pray a long time, do certain things, make certain spiritual pilgrimages, Give our money to the poor. You don't have to. You can. You don't have to to get right with God. That's the freedom we have. We're free from the stuff, the, the list, the spiritual treadmill, the I gotta, I gotta, I gotta. I mean, Catholicism has a lot of that. I mean, how many recovering Catholics do we have? Every time I meet a Catholic, I'm a recovering Catholic. And most Catholics, they tell me, oh my gosh, I mean, church for me in the Catholic church was guilt. Because I have to do, I, I have to do these things. And if I blow it, I got to go to the priest, not directly to Jesus as the Bible says. I got to go to this priest, confess my sins to the priest. The priest then gives me, you know, a hundred push-ups or a hundred pray, pray Marys, and then I'll be right with God. Well, 
Well, how does that work? What happened to the cross of Jesus? Didn't he do the work? So there's nothing for us to do. But the Judaizers are coming in saying, oh, Paul was misleading you. He's letting you off too easy. It's actually a little more difficult than he's painting the picture. The stuff you actually got to do. And you got to learn this Jewish stuff. Now remember, Galatia, is this a Jewish town? Are these Jewish people in this church that he planted? They're Greeks, they're Gentiles, they're not Jewish. But we don't know exactly the composition of the races there in this church, but they're not Jewish. And so these Judaizers are coming in saying, we need to educate you a little more on Jewish history, give you all the backstory so that you become really like us. Hmm. Chapter one, verse three. Paul opens it with what three words? Do you see an exclamation mark? <clears throat> yeah. You foolish Galatians. Then what's he say? Who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly exhibited as crucified. Okay, so Paul called these Christians foolish because, as you remember from the first two chapters, we see they started to believe what the Judaizers taught. Which was that the death of Jesus was actually unnecessary. And that they could get right with God on their own. They could be sure of that instead of this guy they've never seen. And praying the prayers to this invisible Jesus. So you actually can know if you're right with God by, by the list, by doing the law. You got it? That's appealing to a lot of people. So it's, you're getting right with God by your observance of the law. And Paul said right here that it appears that they've been bewitched, literally cast under some evil spell. I mean, I can imagine him going, how else am I supposed to make sense of this? Why in the world would you go backwards? Why would you put this car in reverse? Why, why would you now make things difficult for you? I just told you that Jesus made things difficult for him so that it wasn't difficult for you. And so he reminds them that he vividly, graphically described how and why Jesus was crucified. And that Jesus went through the torture. He went through the death that he did to pay the price of our inability, the impossibility to get right with God on our own by whatever means we try. And to jar their memories that it's by faith alone, as we say. And I got to really open that for everybody's understanding as we go along today. What exactly does that mean by faith alone? There's by faith alone in how Jesus secured our salvation is God's way of saving us. And so, so Paul asks a series of questions to, to jar their memory. Verse 2. The only thing I want to learn from you is this. Did you receive the Spirit of God? You know, when, when, when you become a Christian, what happens? You don't become God, but a piece of God, the Spirit of God, enters your life. You, you get a new download. New software. Don't you? Don't you? Okay, okay anybody who is a Christian here... And here's a hard thing. This is what's difficult to describe to somebody who's not a Christian. Because they, how do you describe this? Because they won't experience it until they become a Christian. But if you weren't one and then you became one, did you change? Did you become perfect? Not a chance. But something happened. You sense something in here. You have a different way of looking at the world, don't you? Automatically. All of a sudden, you're sensitive to stuff. You've got new sensitivities. Your priorities change. It's like somebody changed you. Well, yeah, because you were spiritually dead, and now you're spiritually alive. You went from death to life. And so he's saying, why in the world would you go back to the thing that actually leads you back to spiritual death? So he says, did you receive that spirit of God by doing the works of the law? By you doing stuff, working your, your, your heads off? Or by simply believing what you heard from me. It's rhetorical. Um, sure had nothing to do with them obeying the law, trying to live perfectly. It clearly came only after they heard what Paul said, and then they believed it. They said, okay, we believe this thing that Jesus is this long-promised savior of the Jewish people, but not just of the Jewish people, but of the whole world. I, and I need to be saved. I, I need to get right. I need to get saved from my sinful dead self. I need to be saved from 
my priorities. I need to be saved from where I was going when this life is through. They believed in Jesus for it. And uh, next question. Verse 3 says, are you, are you so foolish having started with a spirit that you're now ending with a flesh? So Paul asks, are they so foolish to think that they, they could begin the Christian life in one way by, by faith, just simply believing what Paul talked about, um, but then end it another way, by works. Literally like um, we're going to start this Christian life by believing, simply believing what we heard about who Jesus is and what he accomplished for us for absolutely free. But now for me to get better, closer to God, more loved by God, I now have to get on that spiritual treadmill and do the list. And he's saying, no, that's not how it works. Verse four, did you experience so much for nothing? If it, if it really was for nothing. And what Paul's referring to is the persecution that the Galatians had already experienced for believing the gospel. That Paul warned them ahead of time, you're going to be persecuted. If you make this change, you're going to believe in Jesus. There's going to be people that aren't going to like you anymore. They're going to think you're weird. They're going to distance them from you, distance themselves from you. They might hate you. They might literally intimidate you, even hurt you. Depends where you live in the world. Christians experience this. People who become Christians, it's amazing what they then experience. And so... If they believe what the Judaizers were telling them, then the Galatians, Paul says, suffered for nothing. You went through all that suffering for nothing. If you're now going back to a, oh, it's has nothing to do with Jesus making me right with the Heavenly Father. It's what I got to do. Verse 5, well then, does God supply you with his spirit? And, and does he work miracles among you by your doing the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? He's saying... To them, to have them remember, God did miracles. He did supernatural things. Like what, what Bruce was talking about, he shared these stories, right? There's some miraculous stories. They're, those, those are things that are called miracles. You know, how do you explain that? But I want to say something too. That, uh, miracles are rare. If they were happening all the time, they'd be called regulars. But they're called miracles because they don't happen all the time. But when they happen, you know they happen. And God doesn't promise to do them, but from time to time, he might throw in on your life, in somebody's life, and you go, how do we explain that outside of God? Something supernatural. Something had to have happened. So, Paul is saying, all those things that God did, these supernatural, miraculous things, they weren't some reward because you obeyed his laws, but it was simply for believing and receiving what they heard about Jesus. And I want to remind you, the Galatians were Gentiles. They didn't even have or know the Jewish law in order to get saved by obeying it. They don't all have their own personal copy of the Bible. They didn't have their little personal Torah to, to, to know what's the list. There's a whole bunch of laws in the Old Testament. They don't know these things. Remember, this is before the printing press. There's no Gideons back there handing out the Old Testament. So they simply believed what they heard from false teachers or real teachers. <sighs> Judaizers, they, they claim to have, have the Old Testament on their side. What we call the Old Testament, you know, back when this was written, that's all there was. Just those scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, scriptures is all they had. And he, Paul is, is, is pointing out that these Judaizers thought they had the scriptures backing up their position and they focused a lot on Moses. You know who Moses is. Moses, the guy who led the Israelites out of slavery back there in Egypt. God used him, part of the Red Sea, all that stuff. Goes to Mount Sinai. All the Jews are camped around, probably a couple million we're thinking around Mount Sinai. Moses walks up because God said, come up here, we'll have a conversation. Moses goes on top of this mountain that to this day is black and charred, if you've ever seen where it is. It's actually in Saudi Arabia. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's not where people think of it. The Bible even says so. Paul says so in Galatians later. So, um, so he's, on, it's on, he's up on this mountain. God talks to him. Of all things, God actually chisels out 
on stone the first 10 how to do things, how to stay in a right relationship with me, how to treat other people. More laws came later. But what we call the Ten Commandments, that's when they showed up. The Judaizers are pointing to that. It's this, it's this, it's this. Jews to this day are very proud that they have the law, that the God of the universe actually gave them a how do we live on earth? How do we live in relationship with him to get right with him, to stay right with him? How to be in right relationship to one another? And a whole bunch of other stuff. A lot of history. They were very proud of that. Paul now says pretty much, oh yeah? You're quoting Moses a lot. The law a lot. Um, let's start again from the very beginning. He takes them back even centuries before Moses to Abraham. That's what's coming now in this chapter. And to consider that Abraham, how he, the father of the Jewish nation, he's the first guy, he and his wife, Sarah, they're the first people God talked to about starting this thing called the Hebrews, the Jewish nation, the Israelites, we know them today, everything else that follows in the Bible. And that was back in Genesis, the very first book of the Bible. Abraham, that's where he shows up. So Paul says, we're going to talk about Abraham and how he got right with God in his day, and it had nothing to do with the law. Here we go. Verse 6. Just as Abraham, quote, believes God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, that's Genesis 15, verse 6. So you see, those who believe are the descendants of Abraham, and the scripture foreseeing that God would count the Gentiles righteous by their faith declared the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the Gentiles shall be blessed in you. And you're going to say, what does all that mean? Abraham's faith in God's ability to perform something that God promised was, in God's eyes, good enough for God to count Abraham as having all the righteousness he ever needed to be forgiven and worthy of a relationship with God and worthy of heaven when he died. Where's, he where's Abraham right now? He's in heaven. That was before Jesus came and died on the cross. People still got to heaven pre-Jesus, but a different way. Still, though, through this thing called faith, what, what God does to save us today is not different from, he, from how the mechanism that he used to save people in the Old Testament. He goes, do you believe me? Why? Because the big hang-up of the world is they don't believe. You don't believe in God. You don't see God, so you don't believe him. You think it's all about you and life's about you or it was an accident. This whole thing evolved. Oh my gosh, let's not go there. I mean, that's the biggest insult to me. The biggest insult to God is evolution. Didn't need you. Four hundred years, over four hundred years before Moses even shows up, God says He considered Abraham righteous. Worthy of a relationship, and, and he could come into heaven with him forever. Really? How so? Nobody died for him yet. There's no Messiah to die for him. How so? Because it says, he believed God's promise. What was the promise? He goes, Abraham, and, okay, Abraham's an old guy. Remember this? And it's, and it's when he's 75 years old, he first hears this. And his 65-year-old wife. Abraham, you and your wife are barren. You're childless. You don't have no kids. I know you want a son. You, you ask me every day, I hear about it. I'm going to give you a kid. You are? But I'm kind of already grandpa age. No, I'm going to give you a kid. Really? Yeah. How long did uh, Abraham wait till he became a father of? 25 years. When he was 100 years old. 100? Wife was 90, and you go, you made 
stuff stops working at that time. I mean, how do you get, how are you going to get pregnant? How's that happening? Well, because God said they would. God said, I'm going to give you a kid. I'm going to make sure your reproductive organs will work and you will literally have a kid. And you're not going to have to worry about that, you know, gestational or, or no, no, that's not what it's called. A geriatric pregnancy thing where you're, you're, you're at risk of whatever when you have a kid in an older age. And it says, simply says this. <laughs> Abraham actually believed God for that thing because that sounds, I mean, that's kind of, sounds ridiculous. My oldest relatives, they lived till you know, mid-90s. My, my Uncle D, I think, he, gosh, he lived in 97, if I'm right, 97. I can't imagine him and Claire Ellen, Aunt Claire Ellen, have a kid. <laughs> a- any part of the process, it just it ain't going to happen. And for her to, I mean, to literally have a baby and then to give birth, I, it just, it ain't going to happen. But that's just their situation. I mean... And it's why Sarah, if you remember, she laughed when she heard about it. She goes, ha, 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 yeah, that's funny. And that's why God says, yeah, well then, uh, as a reminder, if you're laughing at what I promise, you get to name your kid laughter. Isaac, Isaac. So every time little laughter was walking around, they'd go, what a reminder. Okay. This is before the law even comes. Moses doesn't come for another 450 years in the law. What law is there for Abraham to follow, to obey perfectly, to get in a right relationship with God that the Judaizers say you have to do to be in a right relationship with God? You have to follow the law. Well, Abraham, who started off the whole Jewish nation, didn't have a law because it didn't show up for 450 years. And then remember the Judaizers, what's their favorite little thing that they also demand all men to do? Get circumcised. Do I have to do this again? One of the best parts of being a pastor is talking about circumcision. It's just wonderful. <clears throat> Real fast. <clears throat> God comes to Abraham and Sarah at a time when the earth was, for the most part, sexually out of control. Kind of like today. I mean, and I'm so grateful again for Donald Trump and all the things he's promising he's going he's gonna to get rid of and, and make sure there's no, you know, just only two genders. Somehow I think it's a constitutional amendment. I don't know what he's going to do. But he's talking about we're going to make, we're, we're going back, we're making this work and no more of this mutilation stuff. And that's fantastic. But, okay. <clears throat> so, so Abraham and Sarah, they're alive during a time where it's, it's just things are crazy too. And God goes, okay, and, and men, men and women, they're just sleeping around doing whatever. And, and God goes, I need a nation. I need a family that doesn't do this. I need a bunch of people that are sexually controlled and not just sleeping around, with, especially with people of other f- beliefs, because they're going to then change. They're going to leave me and go to that false belief, which they did over and over and over and over and over. Why? Because historically in the Bible, the Jewish men took foreign wives. Because they were attractive. They found them attractive. They're a little different from what we're used to. Kind of like the look. Oh my gosh. So God goes, okay, men, it's starting with you, starting with you, Abraham, and then your kids, and then this is for every male down the road. I'm putting a mark right where it needs to be on your sexual organ and not cutting off your little pinky or tattoo somewhere. We're going to put it right there. Where y'all got the biggest hang up. And the world is so messed up. I'm putting it there. So when you get dressed in the morning, you remember, oh yeah, I belong to God. <laughs> and, and if you ever find yourself in a compromised situation with a woman from another faith, she'll look at you and go, you're Jewish. You're not supposed to do this. <laughs> Pretty smart of God. So the Judaizers are saying to the Gentiles, because the Gentiles living in this time in Rome, which is sexually out of control, I understand why they go, guys, you're sexually out of control. This is what our God tells us to do, and you got to do this. That's why the Judaizers were just hitting this thing. You got to be circumcised. And it's, it's physical, but it's all, it also says something. 
It's a statement. I am restraining myself. I'm going to control my morality. I'm going to make sure that sexual intimacy is for the marriage only, etc. Got it? I can't blame the Judaizers for telling the Gentiles who are sexually out of control, you should do this. I get it. Here's the thing. Paul points out Abraham, he was counted as righteous before circumcision. Before God told him that, God says, I'm going to give you a kid. Really? Yeah, I believe you. All right. And then later he goes, by the way, here's this mark of the covenant, this mark that you and I got this thing, this promise, this pact, you and all the men, which will represent the whole Jewish nation. It's this mark. Okay, you got to do that. But it's before that Abraham is considered righteous. Now, was he? Was he righteous on his own? No, he's a human. I mean, read the rest of the story. Stuff Abraham did. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so here's the deal. Yeah, he had help. So, clearly, Paul, is, he's making a case. He goes, do you see, even with our very first founder, the, the patriarch, the first Jew, Abraham, it had nothing to do with how well you did the list. Obeying the law. It had to do with believing God for what he says. Fast forward to today. How do you get saved? Faith in what? By believing what God says. About what? Specifically, that this guy Jesus actually came out of God himself. Because when Jesus said, he, when, he, when he said, I came from God, he actually, the Greek is, I came out of. It's interesting. Like, I came out of God. Well, yeah, because Jesus is God. And it's as if God takes a part of him, puts it on the earth. And here's Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, walking around the earth. He lives the life we could not live. He pays what we owe God. We owe him our very blood. Jesus is treated by the Heavenly Father as if he lived our lives. You know how this goes. God turns around. The Heavenly Father turns around and treats us like we lived Jesus' life. So we got off the hook. That's why he suffered on the cross. He paid for our sins. We don't have to pay for our sins. Paul says, this is, this is the gospel. The gospel. We heard that, we heard that word so many times. It means good news. Here's the good news. We don't have to do the list. We are saved from our dead self, and we're, we've got heaven open to us forever if we believe by faith what God said about Jesus, his son, that he died in our place, and that that was enough to cover my sins and your sins. And if I believe that, like Abraham believed God for a son. And there's some other promises God gave. Man, I'm going to give you so many descendants. It's more than the stars of the sky. More than the sand, the grains, you know, the, the grains of sand on the seashore. I'm going to give you so many kids. I'm going to give you all this land that you see. All this land called the promised land that they're in today. Still fighting for it. <laughs> Abraham, do you believe it? Yes. Great. Because that's all you could give me. You can't live righteously, so I can't accept you on the basis of you somehow becoming righteous. So I have to simply make this arrangement. I accept you as if you were righteous on the basis of you believing this thing that I said. This sounds totally impossible. Same way, New Testament, Jesus. God says, I'm not saving you on the basis of something you're doing to somehow be righteous enough for me to welcome you in and forgive you of your sins and over, you know, overlook all the bad. But on your believing, your faith, that Jesus took the punishment. That's what he asks for. Whew. Paul says this. Wow, are we going to do this? I'm going to cut and paste. Okay. Um, <clears throat> just look at this. He... he he even says, look at verse 8. The scripture foreseeing that God would count the Gentiles righteous by their faith. Did you hear that? Meaning, meaning back then, during Abraham's time, God already saw the future. He saw these non-Jews being counted like Abraham. Just like Abraham. Being righteous by believing, by having faith in what God now says it was, sounds impossible. Not having a kid in your old age, but being saved by somebody on the, 
on the cross who died for you. Really? That sounds impossible. Well, yeah, but if you believe that, that's, that's the ticket in. And he says, he, he saw that. And he says, righteous by their faith, declared the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying all the Gentiles shall be blessed in you. It literally is saying that back there in the conversation God had with Abraham, he was already giving Abraham the good news. One day, through your line, this is going to be the Messiah. I'm going to send my own son through your line. And he's going to open the door for the whole world to come in a relationship with me, just like you did, Abraham. By believing me for the impossible, I'm going to give them something to believe too. And if they believe it, I'm going to count that as righteousness. Righteous enough to enter my house forever. We all tracking? Verse 9. For this reason, those who believe are blessed with Abraham who believed. Make sense now? For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, cursed is the one who doesn't observe and obey all the things written in the book of the law. Now it's evident that no one is considered as righteous before God by the law, for, quote, the one who is righteous will live by faith. But the law does not rest on faith. On the contrary, whoever does the works of the law will live by them. What you just saw was several quotes, because he's quoting now a bunch of Old Testament scriptures. Can I go through them real quick? So contrary to what the Judaizers were teaching, obeying the law was not the solution to our sinful nature. It could only condemn us. So Paul first quotes Deuteronomy 27 verse 26 to show that the law demanded utter perfection and that a curse was attached to failure to keep any part of it. The breaking, this is where God said, if you break even one of the laws, I'm counting you as guilty of breaking all of it. Every single law. That's what he's quoting. Okay. Then, then, then he quotes Habakkuk, who wrote, The righteous will live by faith. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. So back then, again, in the Old Testament, oh, wait, he says, The righteous will live by works. No. The righteous will live by doing a whole lot of things that God asks of us to do perfectly. No. The righteous will live by faith. That's Old Testament. Then he quotes Leviticus 18.5. The man who does the works of the law will live by them. This is how Eugene Peterson, in the, the message, his paraphrase of the New Testament, he writes this. He says this way. Rule keeping. Rule, any rule keepers? Rule keepers? Rule keepers? Don't you know? I don't like those people, do you? Huh? Rule keeping does not naturally evolve into living by faith, but only perpetuates itself in more and more rule keeping. A fact of scripture observed is this. The one who does these things, the rule keeping, continues to live by them. You just keep rule keeping. So he's simply saying the Bible even says in the Old Testament, if you're a rule keeper, man, that you're condemned. That's your thing. You think that's how you're going to get right with God. So he's trying to tell these, gen, these Gentile believers in Galatia, don't do this because the scriptures he's quoting, he's showing the Judaizers as false teachers. Now, only... Per perfect performance could win divine approval under the law. But since that was not achievable, the law then could only condemn people. And then it says we're under a curse because of that. And in verse 13, again, Paul quotes Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23, that refers to the Old Testament times when criminals were executed and then hung on a post or a tree to show that they were under this curse by God for their sinful lives. And then he says that Jesus took that curse upon himself, evident by how he was killed, hung up on a post. Mm. Verse 13, Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written. Here's the quote from Deuteronomy. Cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. I just told you what that's in reference to. It's like, wow. Remember stocks? People used to be in stocks back in the, those days, back in Europe, stocks. Your head and your hands and your arms and those things. Same kind of idea. Somebody's hang, hanging on the street. Uh-oh. They, they did something wrong. They got capital punishment. And, and they automatically said they must have deserved it because the Jewish leaders carried that out. And so that, the curse of God was on them for breaking God's laws. But he says, Jesus redeemed us from that curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. In order that in Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Not to be redundant, but how did Jesus die? On a tree. Meaning, he was under a curse for breaking the laws. 
He, Paul's just going, the reason why he was doing that in fulfillment of Old Testament scripture is because he was, he took the curse upon himself so we don't have to. He points to the cross as evidence that Jesus took that curse upon himself. Verse 15, I'm going to read this from the message. Do you still hang in there? Are we all right? Friends, let me give you an example from everyday affairs of the free life I'm talking about. Once a person's will, think of the last will and testament, has been signed, no one else can annul it or add anything to it. Now, the promises were made to Abraham and to his descendant. You will observe that scripture in the careful language of a legal document does not say to descendants, referring to everybody in general, but to your descendant. The noun note is singular, referring to Jesus who would come one day. This is the way I interpret it, says Paul. A will earlier signed by God is not annulled by an addendum attached 430 years later. That would be the law in Moses' day. Thereby negating the promise of the will at the beginning. No, this addendum, the law, with its instructions and regulations has nothing to do with the promised inheritance in the will. So Paul is saying that the promise God made to Abraham was good as a person's last will and testament. And any addendum that God made to that will, namely the law, is only that. It's an addendum. It's extra information that doesn't affect what Abraham and his spiritual family made through the Messiah would receive and how they'd receive it. It's still through faith. But the Jews got confused. They see the law come in. Oh, this is how we do it. We got to follow this thing. No, you can't. What it shows, if anything, is that you clearly can't. So you have to throw yourself at the mercy of the court. It shouldn't make you run to me to say, God, I can't do this. You're expecting too much. He goes, no, I'm not expecting you to do it. You can't. I'm going to send somebody who can. But until then, we'll keep going. Verse 18. What is then the point of the law? This attached addendum. It was a thoughtful addition to the original covenant promises made to Abraham. The purpose of the law was to keep a sinful people in the way of salvation until Jesus, the descendants, came. Who inherited the promises and distributed them to all of us. Obviously, this law was not a first-hand encounter with God. It was arranged by angelic messengers through a middleman, Moses. And if there's a middleman, as there was at Sinai when the law was given, then the people are not dealing directly with God, are they? But the original promises was a direct blessing of God received by faith. What does that mean? Paul asks, uh, I think, a question that his readers are probably asking at this point, which is, okay, what then is the point of the law? Why did God give the Jewish nation the law? And he says, well, it's for three reasons. First, it's given for a means of checking sins. It served as a restrainer of sins by showing them that God had a way for them to live, and they weren't doing it. Second, the law served its purpose until the Messiah would come. Third, the law was inferior to the Messiah because it required mediators. Um, the idea that there was angels representing God, Moses representing the people, it just required something else. Like again, Catholicism requires a priest, a middleman. But, but Paul is saying, remember back in Abraham's day, there was no middleman. God spoke directly to Abraham. He didn't even need a priest back then. That was behold the whole priest system, the whole sacrificial system. Oh, wow, remember that? So you actually always could go directly to God. Uh-oh. Verse 21. If such is the case, is the law then an anti-promise, a negation of God's will for us? He's asking a question the readers are probably asking. Not at all, he says. Its purpose was to make obvious to everybody that we are in ourselves out of right relationship with God. And therefore to show us the futility of devising some religious system for getting by on our own efforts. Well, we can only get by, we can only get by waiting in faith for God to complete his promise. Now, he says... if. If any kind of rule keeping had power to create life in us, we would certainly have gotten it by this time. You still good? Verse 23. A little more will be done. Now, before faith came, faith in Jesus, we were imprisoned, guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Jesus came so that we might be considered as righteous by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinary. And hang on to that word. For in Jesus, you're all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Jesus have clothed yourself with Jesus. There's no longer Jew or Greek, no longer slave or free. There's no longer male, female. For all of you are one in Jesus. And if you belong to Jesus, then you're Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. 
That's the end. But let me explain what he just said. He said be, be, before this faith came in Jesus, he said we were imprisoned, we were, we were guarded um, until this faith would, would come. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian. Okay? So you might have heard this before, but there's a Greek word called pedagogos. Pedagogos was an actual person. Again, Paul's writing to Greeks. Every Greek knows exactly what Paul just said. There's this person called the pedagogos, and every Greek family would have one. And the pedagogos uh, was considered, oh, a child. It's hard to, to interpret exactly the word, but think of it as child leader, kind of a guardian, kind of a nanny. It's a hybrid. This person's job, if they weren't as a slave already living in the house, they would come to the house, a Greek home. They would literally get your kid, take them by the hand, take them from the father's hand, walk them, escort them to school where they're going to learn. The pedagogos' job was simply this, to take you to school, hold your hand, make sure nobody got in the way, nobody stopped you, nobody interrupted, there'd be no danger, they would protect the kid, kind of a, a, a guardian. And this person would bring them to school, be with them, be a tutor, school is done, the pedagogos would take the kid by the hand, walk them back home, and put that hand in the hand of the dad. Paul is saying, until Jesus came, it was the law that took us by the hand, took us to school, educated us, and ultimately it's to point us and bring us back, to, it's to bring us to God. But he goes, Jesus is the improvement on that. He's the one who literally takes us by the hand, enters our lives, leads us differently by internal guidance, not external law. And he ultimately, his job is to bring us to the Father. That's who Jesus is. That's what he does. And then Paul ends with this just beautiful statement where he says, listen, if, 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 if you were baptized, if you were dunked, submerged, again is the word, if you were like submerged into Jesus, this wonderful faith, then hey, you, you, got, you got a brand new outfit on. You got the Jesus clothes on too. It's fantastic. And he says, and now, there, there's no hierarchy, no, no difference, no socioeconomic differences between us. Rich, poor, free slave, Jew, Greek, male, female, not modern understanding of that. He goes, we're all one. A meaning anybody can have this. Anybody can have this relationship with Jesus. Anybody. Salvation by faith in him is free for the asking for anybody. You don't have to be Jewish like the Judaizers who are saying you have to be Jewish. If you're not by blood, you have to act like it. Paul goes, it's all thrown out the, the door. That's Galatians chapter 3. I hope I covered it to a way that you understand it. Okay. So, worship team, come up here. We're going to pray. And you know, we're, we're talking about faith. Paul is, is making it clear that it's our faith. Do I believe? And here's the thing, again, I, I want to remind you. It's, a, it's, it's something you do. It's between you and God. Saying, I believe this. And, um, and it's actually God's faithfulness that this whole thing hangs on. It's not ours anyway, because even if it's our save, we're saved by faith, I want to ask you a question. How consistent is your faith? Doesn't your faith kind of wane? Do, doesn't it kind of goes up and down and strong and then weak and sometimes you're consistent and sometimes you're not? Well, I'm glad that we're saved by our our faith, meaning our initial belief in who Jesus is and what he did for us, but we're not kept saved by it because our faith, our desire to even be close to God goes up and down. But God's is steady, totally consistent. We're going to sing a great hymn of the faith. Great is thy faithfulness. Let's stand up.